Welcome, Ben Mama. It's fair to say that the Amstrad CPC was pretty late to the 8-bit computer war. By the time it arrived in April 1984, many of its potential rivals like the Oric 1, Dragon 32 and Memotech MTX were already falling away, and the market was narrowing to just a handful of machines, leaving very little room for anyone new to come along and make an impact. But it's also fair to say that the CPC did just that. And as Sugar's 8 bit computer found a nice niche that its competitors hadn't even realised existed, and made the most of it, but more on that later. And soon became the third most popular 8 bit computer in the UK, replacing the BBC Micro. In fact, you'll hear many people talk about the holy trinity of UK 8 bit micros, placing the Amstrad CPC alongside the best selling Sinclair ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64. So given the popularity of the Amstrad CPC, which was also ranked 8th in the viewer voted Greatest Home Computers of All Time video I did on this very channel a couple of years ago, you'd have expected it to win its poll easily, right? Well, actually, no. It lost out in the voting twice before, so this was very much a case of third time lucky. In fact, it nearly didn't win this time either, as the voting remained very close right up until the end, the Amstrad CPC and Sega SC3000 swapping the first place position several times. In fact, this is probably the closest poll I've ever seen for an Amazing Facts video, as you can see from that final result. But here we are. In the end, the Amstrad CPC was the computer you wanted to see me feature, and there is plenty of interesting pieces of trivia to explore here. So without further ado, it's time for the main event as I proudly present 10 Amazing Amstrad CPC Facts. Hello and welcome to the Amstrad Games. We've got a packed program today brought to you exclusively on the 464 and the 6128. There's Grand Prix Racing where the hot favourite is Bill Wilson. Then it's boxing with heavyweight champion Bone Crusher Wilson. But stay with us now for live coverage of Wildman Wilson's daring attempt to jump 25 buses on a motorbike. Amstrad <laughs> Computers. Loads more fun. We really can't talk about the CPC range without talking about Amstrad themselves, and what led to them creating it in the first place. And of course the man behind Amstrad is integral to this, one Alan Michael Sugar, whose initials were added to an abbreviation of the word trading to create the company name. Although a lot of home computers were produced by existing home electronics companies like Texas Instruments, Tandy Radio Shack and Sinclair Research, most of these specialised in very specific areas often moving from making things like radios and calculators to computers. But Amstrad really did have a finger in every single pie. Founded in 1968 as a way of importing cheap Asian electronics into the UK, which proved to be a hugely successful venture, it wasn't long before the company started manufacturing their own products. Their hugely diverse product range included such things as amplifiers, TVs, hi-fis, car stereos and word processors. So a home computer really was the final piece to the puzzle, and soon became a key focus of the company. Towards the end of the 80s, Amstrad also started producing some of the earliest set-top boxes for satellite TV providers, most notably Sky. And this venture proved to be so successful for the company that it soon became their sole focus and eventually led to Sky acquiring the whole company in July 2007 for a cool $125 million, leaving Alan Sugar a nice lump sum of capital to pursue other ventures. One of the main reasons why the Amstrad CPC range was a success in an already crowded market where lots of other computers, like the Dragon 32, Oric and Computers Lynx had failed, was because Alan Sugar's company very much learned from other manufacturers' mistakes, and one big area that became key for a home computer's success was the availability of software. Amstrad had already identified the troublesome chicken and egg situation. The meant a computer wouldn't get supported with software until it was successful, and wouldn't be successful unless it had good software. This was something that two of their biggest rivals in Sinclair and Atari had got right, introducing their computers alongside their own wide range of software and their own publishing arm to keep this going. 
The big advantage that Amstrad had over both these companies, however, was hardware familiarity, as the CPC contained the same Zilog Z80 CPU that could already be found in computers like the ZX Spectrum and MSX, as well as an equally familiar General Instruments AY sound chip. This made porting games from other systems easy, rather than potential programmers having to start from scratch and learn the hardware first. Almost as soon as Amstrad founded the new Amsoft label, they approached already successful publishers of Sinclair ZX Spectrum games like Gem Software, Jurel, Romic, Micromega and Argus Press to supply them with games. They then bundled a 12-pack of these titles that included several productivity packages and educational programs alongside the more fun titles, with every CPC-464 computer. They then continued to publish new games and other software on the Amsoft label right up until 1986, when the CPC market was now big enough to support itself. I mentioned in the last entry that Amstrad took a long time analysing both the failures and indeed successes of their many rivals before entering the crowded home computer market. They knew that if they had any chance of making the CPC range a success, they would have to not only correct the errors made by others, but also find some genuine selling points to make the computer more attractive than already successful rivals like the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro and Commodore 64. One of the first things that Amstrad identified was that when parents bought their kids a home computer, they often had to buy them a TV set to use with it too, so they wouldn't dominate the main one in the living room. This added greatly to an already high expense, and played a big part in UK families buying cheaper home computers like the ZX Spectrum, the then market leader in Amstrad's home territory, and to solve this they took a look at the business computer market, where people usually bought all-in-one packages that included a monitor, disc or tape drive, and the computer itself. Given that they already had their own large manufacturing base that could produce all of these things, it seemed like something that could be transferred into the home computer market at more than reasonable cost. So from very early on it was decided that the CPC-464 computer would feature a built-in tape deck, something not seen since late 70s PCs like the Commodore PET and Sharp MZ range, and it would also come bundled with a bespoke monitor using the exact same design aesthetics that would be available in two flavours, colour and green screen, with just over £100 difference between the two, making the latter more attractive than you might think, especially if you were buying a CPC for more serious uses and not to play games. Amstress all-in-one offering proved to be a wise bet, and exactly what many households were looking for. They could buy a complete computer package with everything needed to get started, including software to use with it too. No extras needed, and no hidden costs. Well played Lord Sugar, well played. It's pretty much impossible to talk about the Amstrad CPC without talking about its biggest rival, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. In fact, the rivalry with Sir Clive's machine started well before the CPC was even unveiled, when Alan Sugar stated that he wanted his new machine to resemble a real computer, similar to what someone would see being used to check them in at the airport for their holidays, and for the machine to not look like a pregnant calculator, like the Spectrum. Unfortunately, his jibes at the ZX Spectrum backfired somewhat once the CPC hit the market, mainly due to hardware similarities between the two competing home micros, which I touched on in the segment about Amsoft already. As well as the CPC using almost exactly the same CPU as the Speccy and having a near identical sound chip to the 128K enabled Spectrum models, it also had a graphics mode that offered a pretty similar resolution too, albeit with just four colours. This meant that porting games over to the CPC from the Spectrum was relatively easy, with skilled programmers able to complete the task in just a couple of days. This might sound good, as it gave the Amstrad CPC a much bigger software library than other machines that sold in similar numbers, because there was much less risk, work and expense involved in publishers supporting it. But the big problem with this was that simply porting across from the Spectrum gave you a game that didn't maximise the CPC hardware or use it to its full potential. Games would often run very slowly due to the lack of optimization. would be in monochrome when the CPC could display 27 colours without the dreaded attribute clash of the Spectrum, and in the case of 48k Spectrum games being ported across, you would also have very minimal sound too. 
Lazy Spectrum ports will become a huge bugbearer of Amstrad CPC owners everywhere. Rather ironically, Alan Sugar would actually end up buying Sinclair's computer division on the 7th of April 1986, giving him all rights to the rival ZX Spectrum. He would even introduce new Spectrum models including the Plus 2, Plus 3 and Plus 2A that would compete with his own Amstrad branded CPC machines and borrowed many of the same design aesthetics too. What made this even more embarrassing for Amstrad and rather galling for its loyal owners was that the Spectrum ended up outliving the CPC, being discontinued just over a year later. As we know, the first Amstrad CPC computer, the 464, was launched in June 1984 to some fanfare, but many were actually surprised it was the sole computer in the range, given Amstrad often liked to sell a range of products to suit every budget. The only initial option was whether to stump up the extra cash for a colour monitor or make do with a green screen. However, Amstrad had promised that a disc-based model was on the horizon, just under a year later, they delivered, as they unveiled the new CPC-664 on April the 25th, 1985, to a great expectation. As with the 464 and its built-in tape deck, the 664 had a built-in disk drive and a near-identical keyboard. However, its looks were much more sedate. Gone were the multicoloured keys, and in their place were newly arranged, more muted grey plastic tops. It was clear that they were aiming the 664 at the business market. Internal specs were exactly the same with 64K of RAM and identical audio-visual chips, with Amstrad focusing on the ability to use CPM 2.2. In fact, Amstrad focused much of their advertising on promoting the fact that the CPC-664 was the lowest cost CPM 2.2 machine on the market. By far the most remarkable feature of the new Amstrad computer though was the disk drive itself. So Amstrad chose to use their own proprietary 3 inch floppies, rather than the more standardised 5 and a quarter or 3.5 inch formats. These drives could also be found on their business focused PCW computers and word processors and would later be used on the Amstrad produced Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus 3.2. Aside from their size, the main difference with these discs was that they had to be ejected and turned over to read the other side. A lot of people criticised this decision accusing Amstrad of money grabbing by forcing people to buy their own discs. The disc format wasn't the only point of contention with the 664 either. Press and consumers alike were unimpressed with what this new model had to offer, as they expected some sort of upgrade over the original hardware and didn't see CPM compatibility as a particularly big draw. In particular, they felt the machine needed a lot more RAM, especially as the CPC's hardware was already very memory intensive without the addition of DOS functions, and to be fair, Amstrad actually listened. Just two months later, they replaced the CPC-664 with the CPC-6128, making it one of the most short-lived home computers ever. As the name no doubt gives away, the CPC-6128 featured double the amount of RAM, but the 128K memory wasn't the only upgrade, as this new model also had an updated operating system that added CPM Plus compatibility, making it even more attractive to business users. The case design was virtually identical to the 664, but with a slightly more colourful shortcut diagram on top of the drive. This new model became a huge hit with consumers and remained part of the CPC range alongside the existing CPC-464 until they were both replaced by the new Plus models in 1990, but more on that later. Earlier on in this video, I spoke a great deal about the CPC's external design and what led to those choices being made but I also think it's important to speak about the internals of the 8-bit Amstrad 2, as there are some very interesting nuggets of trivia to examine here also. You see, the development of what became the Amstrad Color Personal Computer was actually quite fraught. The original design team struggled to deliver what they originally promised, missing all the deadlines set by Sugar, and eventually had to be removed from the project completely, at which point the man often called the father of the CPC, Roland Perry, came along and was joined by his friend William Powell. They quickly worked out that the original specs of the machine were somewhat problematic. Very early on in the design phase, it had been decided that the Arnold, as it was codenamed, would be based around an MOS 6502, the same CPU found in the Apple II, BBC Micro, Atari 8-bit, and of course the Commodore 64. 
As Amstrad felt, this processor offered the most bang for their buck. They then proposed a custom graphics chip to go alongside it and set about working on this first. As the CPUs and sound chips needed were already widely available. But when Roland stepped in, he found a chaotic design that was far from ready and wouldn't work with the proposed 6502. He also raised the point that he had no experience with the 6502 either, which would delay the design process even further. Whereas he knew the Zilog Z80 inside out and could implement that alongside the graphics and sound chips very quickly. This issue was compounded further by locomotive software, who would be providing the basic as well as other programs for Amstrad. They too had no 6502 experience and said that they would not be able to deliver a fully featured version of BASIC to go in the ROM unless the CPU was changed to Roland's already preferred Xilog Z80. And this pretty much made the decision for Alan Sugar and he authorised the change in design. It certainly would have been interesting to see how different the Amstrad CPC would have performed with a 6502 instead of a Z80. Oh, and it's also worth noting that the first prototypes didn't have a dark grey case either. It was originally a kind of light beige. Although the Amstrad CPC was very much a British computer, it also proved popular in many other countries too, particularly France, where it replaced the Oric as the Gallic home micro of choice, and it remained so until the Atari ST took over in the late 80s. But the Amstrad CPC's success in France is very well known, so let's take a look at some other regions too. The German story is perhaps the most interesting because in this case Amstrad licensed the hardware to a different manufacturer in Schneider who were one of the leading electronics companies in the region and had previously sold Philips computers in that area as well as various Pong clones. Not only were these computers rebadged but they were also redesigned slightly too with much more muted colours, proper expansion ports and in the case of the Schneider CPC664 a different keyboard layout too. These proved to be pretty popular for the company and encouraged them to later move into the IBM PC compatible sector just as their partners Amstrad did. Another interesting story is that of Spain, where the Amstrad CPC also proved pretty popular because this region even got its own exclusive model, although more from necessity rather than actual planning. You see, back in the mid 80s the Spanish government introduced a law that meant that any computers with more than 64k of RAM got big tax breaks. This was actually the main reason why the Spectrum 1 to 8 came to market, as it was a joint venture between both Sinclair and local company Investronica, and released in Spain a couple of months before the UK. This rule saw Amstrad produce a CPC 472 specifically for the Spanish market that added an extra 8k of RAM, but this chip was basically locked out and not used, and was only there to get around the ruling. Other countries where the CPC had some success included Greece, Denmark and Australia, the only country outside of Europe where it made any kind of impact. The CPC 6128 was in fact launched in the United States, two months before it hit the UK in fact, but was largely ignored by the Apple, IBM and Commodore loving consumers, causing it to be withdrawn from the market fairly quickly. This entry leads on very nicely from the last, because we are once again talking about the Amstrad CPCs outside of the UK, but in this case the completely unlicensed models that don't seem to be anywhere near as well known, so they deserve some special focus I feel. You probably won't be surprised to hear that both of these machines originate from Eastern Europe, which was totally unregulated at this time, meaning that local companies regularly imported and then copied successful Western designs. The first of these originated from eastern Germany, where it's likely the company obtained a Schneider CPC from the western part of the country and then proceeded to copy it. The KC Compact or Klein Computer, which translates to small computer, being a literal German translation of the English microcomputer, was built by VEB Microelectronic Mulhausen and launched in October 1989, some five years after the CPC first debuted. This machine contained its own German language operating system, but still retained a very high level of compatibility with the original hardware. Like the CPC-464, it is also equipped with 64K of memory and included an unlicensed version of Locomotive BASIC that was modified in the startup banner only. 
The KC Compact was actually the last 8-bit computer to be introduced in Eastern Germany, as the German reunification happened just a month after its release, meaning only a very small number of systems were sold before it was withdrawn from the market completely to avoid any potential legal disputes with Amstrad or Schneider. And if you thought the KC Compact was late to market, the next clone is even more surprising, as it hit shelves in 1993, nearly 10 years after the Amstrad CPC first debuted. The Patisonic Aleste 520EX originated from the southern Russian city of Omsk, and was actually a pretty innovative machine, because it could be switched between two modes, one that cloned the CPC hardware, and another that allowed compatibility with the Japanese MSX standard which is no doubt where the name of the computer came from. This was possible because both machines used a Zilog Z80 CPU, the same sound chip, and had some similar graphics modes too. Not a lot more is known about these computers, and they are now very rare and highly sought after. If you're familiar with the Amstrad brand, then you'll no doubt know about the computer that followed on from the CPC the PCW. Aimed purely at business customers, the PCW took the all-in-one design even further, with disk drives built into the green screen monitors and also came with a printer. This computer was primarily focused on word processing and promoted as a replacement for your old typewriter, but could also be used for other tasks too of course. It proved to be an absolutely massive success, with the press of the time describing it as the bargain of the decade. This massive popularity got Alan Sugar thinking about how he could improve the PCW further and possibly combine it with the CPC in some way, especially as both machines shared the same Zilog Z80 CPU and the same off-standard 3-inch discs. And in 1986, the year after the PCW debuted, Amstrad's engineers started planning out a new home computer that they originally codenamed Arnold 2, following on from the CPC's codename, before renaming it Ant. The idea was that Ant would be an upgraded version of the CPC 6128 that also offered full compatibility with the PCW range through a new mode. There were also plans to add some upgrades to the CPC hardware too as part of this, although what these enhancements would have been has never been fully detailed. But after seeing sales of both the CPC and PCW increase dramatically, Lord Sugar decided that the Ant wasn't really needed and he wasn't entirely sure where it would fit in the market so it was sadly cancelled. But it would have been interesting to see how this one turned out. Now we move to the very end of the 80s, where rumours of an upgraded Amstrad CPC had been circulating for some time. Amstrad were rapidly losing market share to new 16-bit computers like the Atari 520ST and Commodore Amiga 500 that were getting cheaper all the time, not to mention the threat of various home consoles which were rapidly gaining popularity. After sitting on their hands for far too long, Amstrad finally announced the CPC's replacement in the summer of 1990, when they unveiled the new CPC Plus range that would debut just in time for Christmas. Not only would this new range feature upgraded versions of both the tape-based CPC-464 and disc-based CPC-6128, which would be identifiable by a plus sign on the end of the name, it would also include a new 8-bit cartridge-based games console called the Amstrad GX4000, which was designed to compete with the Sega Master System, Atari 7800 Pro System and Nintendo NES. All three systems were designed around the exact same technology, which is an enhanced version of the existing CPC hardware that featured a much larger colour palette, hardware scrolling, hardware sprites and stereo sound too. This announcement was met by a pretty lukewarm reception, with many people feeling this relatively minor upgrade to the creaking 8-bit technology was just not enough, especially as it was based around the exact same 4MHz Zilog Z80 CPU. Amstrad owners were expecting a genuine 16-bit upgrade to compete with the Amiga and Atari ST. Indeed, the latter of those had already replaced the CPC as the home computer format of choice in France, where Amstrad had previously been the market leaders. People also questioned the decision to create a console too, not seeing a way that Amstrad could compete with the financial might of Japanese giants like Sega and Nintendo. Amstrad promised that these new machines would be supported by a huge range of arcade quality games which would include upgrades of popular CPC titles 
as well as lots of new ones too. They had signed up a raft of leading publishers including the likes of Ocean Software, Domark, Titus, Ubisoft and Laura Seals to create cartridge based games, which would also be compatible with the new CPC Plus computers thanks to the addition of a cartridge slot. However, when the new machines arrived on the market, it was soon discovered that the vast majority of the 20 odd so called new titles on offer were simply the existing CPC games repackaged in a more expensive format with no improvements at all. Why would people pay £25 for a game on cartridge that could already be bought on tape for just under £3? It was reported that Amstrad had allocated a marketing budget of £20 million to push this new range across Western Europe, with a US launch to come in the following year, but this was said to be around a tenth of the budgets proposed at rivals like Sega and Nintendo, giving the GX4000 console and its computer-based siblings no chance of competing. Amstrad's fortunes were not helped by ridiculous quotes such as this one by Amstrad designer Cliff Lawson who stated that the GX4000 and CPC Plus were at least as good as the SNES, which was just laughable. Within a matter of months both the GX4000 and CPC Plus range were being heavily discounted by retailers and all of Amstrad's own adverts and marketing seemed to have been radically adjusted to push new games focused PC compatibles instead. The whole CPC Plus range was discontinued just a year later with much embarrassment for Lord Sugar and Amstrad, especially as they kept the CPC's long term rival and technologically inferior ZX Spectrum on the market for a year longer. The homework case was closed and he loaded a ROM cartridge, knowing that within the latest keyboard plus monitor of this real computer looked the evil villains he was after. Horrified bystanders looked on as his guns blazed against this ruthless enemy. Still doing your homework? Good boy. He couldn't have done it without the Amstrad. Disk drive 6128 plus a cassette drive 464 plus. They're real computers. They both take cartridge. They play great games. But don't tell Ma about the game. And that wraps up my look at 10 amazing Amstrad CPC facts. But which one of these fabulous facts was your favourite? Or can you think of any other tantalising tidbits of trivia that I didn't include? We always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my little patrons who continue to support my channel and make videos like this possible. And I must give special thanks to following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Paul Daniel, Mins, Dos Gamerman, Luke MC, Carl Olson, Seth Robinson, Grady Haynes, Mark Strickland, Kalimatorn, Trogdor the Burninator, Daniel Skronsky, Ben P. Stein, Tavi Kitsune, Alan J. Dodds, Your Eyes Are Bleeding, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.